Right. Okay. Well, I'll um, I'll just say hello to everyone. Um, as soon as you can hear me, and uh, happy Christmas. Welcome to the John Popham tribute event. Uh, because when I heard about um, John's disease, I thought it reminded me because he it was obviously online cataloging his his progress, his treatment, etc. And it was always a reminder that we're only we're only visitors here, and uh, our time is short, so we need to make the most of it. And one of the things that I learned from John was be kind uh, to everyone that that you can be kind to. So I'm going to tell a little story about how I first came across John. It was over 10 years ago, maybe 11 years ago. And it was actually, I, I first met Mike through Phil Kirby, I think it was. And I learned about progress school that Mike runs and still does. And I, it sounded really interesting. I thought I'll go along to that. And so we arranged to meet at the Midnight Bell. Do you remember the Midnight Bell in Leeds? And they had some kind of event on, I believe. It was a barbecue and they were giving food away and drinks. They used to do that, you know, in. Uh, in those times and so I was queuing with uh, with Mike and John turned up and so I got introduced to John and we sat down at a table and then John got out his, his mobile phone and then he got out a Blackberry and then he got out some other device and I thought this guy seems to be into gadgets <laughs> uh, and I very quickly learned that was his his bag and so uh when John learned about Better Culture, he loved the format and the telling of the stories and the, the sort of community type thing, uh, which is why he volunteered to video them. So he, he videoed a great many. And John became the go-to guy for any tech questions that I'm, I might have or Richard might have. Uh, and he went to great trouble to, to answer them if he could. And he usually could. In fact, we even did a, um, we did a podcast with John as well. Tom Forth was in uh, one of them. So, so John has been a big influence on Better Culture and on, and on me. Um, so this is in tribute to, to John's legacy. He, I'm sure he would have loved this whole online thing and the sharing of stories. So I'm going to hand over to our first presenter, Mr. Tim Difford. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And Ivan, thanks everyone. Uh, great to be here. Real, real privilege to be at this very uh, special Better Culture. Uh, so, John and I eventually met in, in roughly the same uh, place and time, having travelled there from very different directions, despite having quite a lot of things in common. But where I was approaching the excitement of the internet and its social media heartbeat from the direction of exclusivity, John had already realised what would still take several years to dawn on me and, and, and quite a few of the rest of us that inclusivity is, is the key. So exclusivity versus inclusivity. Um, it might sound obvious to us now, but what do I mean by that? Well, by the time Twitter appeared in about 2008, I'd already been through several waves of excitement at the potential of the internet for connecting like minds, regardless of their location through pre-web flirtations with telnet message boards to some anonymous and semi-autobiographical whimsy and nonsense when I'd started blogging in the early 2000s. But some of this initial excitement has filled out a bit for me. But back in my teens, I used to sell deck chairs on the prom in Blackpool in the summer, where my nickname was Tim Different. And if you liked James, I preferred them when they were on Factory. And if you liked everything but the girl, I preferred Tracy Thorne when she was in the Marine Girls. And if you like New Order, I preferred a certain ratio. But a few years before that, I'd spent a couple of years exploring the world of heavy rock and going with one of my best friends to see the likes of Thin Lizzy and UFO at places like Preston Guildhall. And it was a great time, but after a while, I began to notice other interesting things going on out of the corner of my eye. My appetite to explore the intriguing world of Killing Joke and the Southern Death Cult and Bauhaus wasn't shared by my pal. But the final straw came when I rocked up at his house proudly brandishing the 12 inch single of Asylums in Jerusalem by Scritti Politti. And it was too much for him as he secured tickets for Saxon at Lancaster University. I veered off into the world of Aztec Camera 
Joseph Kay and the Bluebells without him. But don't get me wrong, I did actually love all the new things that I was discovering, but in reality, I hadn't fallen out with Motorhead, White Spirit and the Tigers of Pantang. But the 80s were tribal, man. Well, what's this got to do with John, you might ask? Well, many of you know how much he loved those rock bands throughout his life, but what John realised was that you didn't have to abandon your own passions to appreciate someone else's. In fact, whilst the internet and social media in particular was a great resource for finding those sometimes arcane communities of interest, it was the wild cards that it also threw up that are often the source of the magic and the excitement. And John had found a way of staying true to some deeply held passions and interests, whether that be music, beer, cricket or Notts County, and through a lifetime of public spirited commitment to improving people's lives, building that into an appreciation for and an enthusiasm for the transformative power of tech and its potential for bringing people together. And it was exciting when the power of community combined with the internet and brought these passions together in magical ways. The social media train which shuttled between Huddersfield and Sheffield brought those together who expressed a love for public transport, social media, storytelling and beer in any combination. And along with social media cafes, tuttle clubs, workshops, surgeries, bar camps and unconferences across the country, I relished my third wave of internet magic. At that time, you could introduce new people to the power of Twitter by asking your network to wave at you. And within seconds, your feed would light up with people you connected with from different walks of life, welcoming newbies to this increasingly less than secret new world. But of course, what I'd missed in my slightly snooty, exclusive, clubby and cliquey approach, and what John had realised from the start, is that the thing that makes the online world special is the offline world. And that's sometimes the real magic happens in when those virtual synapses of online networks snap together at a real event, often with some life-changing consequences. John's calm and persistent approach to inclusivity and the use of technology for social good taught me a huge amount and was massively ahead of the global tech industry. Years after meeting John, I joined Microsoft where I still work and I realized that what had taken many years and two CEOs after Bill Gates to realize was something that John had recognized and promoted throughout his career. The company's mission of using inclusive design to enable every organization and individual on the planet to achieve more struck me as something which John had been advocating for years. This quiet vision this continued appetite to reach out and offer positive support to an increasingly distracted online community was one of the things which for me made John unique. What an absolute pleasure to have known and worked with John. We even went together to see Rush a couple of times, a band that we both loved. So from the spirit of radio to the spirit of internet. They say you shouldn't really meet your heroes, but here's a picture with, of me with three of mine. Thanks very much. Ooh. Thank you, Tim. Absolutely brilliant. And I didn't realise you were so uh, so well connected that you could get a shot of uh, Rush and, and yourselves and, and with John Popham, of course. That was well, you know, they, they heard that the two of us were coming to the gig and got in touch and uh, asked if they could. Uh, <laughs> where, whereabouts was the gig? It was at Manchester Arena. And it was a, it was the weirdest thing. I think they're fairly commonplace now. These things where you, um, you, you, you arrange to do a pre-meet with the with the band, and we uh, John had, in, had got us some tickets for this pre-meet at, at, at the gig, and we were shuttled around from concrete breeze block room to concrete breeze block room in almost military fashion, and lined up with about thirty other people in this room, and it literally it was like. You know, you see those films where people are, are, await, are awaiting the hangman's noose and then suddenly the hangman comes in and, and in about five seconds, boom, it's all done. Well, it was like that. Mm. So we stood there for about an hour waiting. And all of a sudden, the door at the end opened and said, right, they're here now. Don't touch to them, talk to them, to, or, or, or give them anything. And then very quickly, all 30 people shook hands, stood in front of the camera and smiled with Rush. And probably 90 seconds later, the room was empty and they'd gone. So it was the weirdest and strangest thing, but funny and fantastic for all that. And it was great to do it with John. Oh, that's a great, uh, that's a great <laughs> story. I see, I, it's really weird actually, Tim, how uh, a lot of the things that, that John was prophesying are, are now starting to happen. I mean, I've I've bought some lights uh, and, a, and a tripod for the yeah. for the camera, and, what I mean, and I'm talking to a to a camera now rather than 
life faces, but it's something that we're going to have to get used to because it's clearly going to be a part of the future for a long time to come. Even though we might have these live events, if you've, as you've described, where a lot of the magic happens, I think a lot of events are going to be online by choice, where it could have been uh, could have been live. Because it's so much easier and cheaper to a certain extent. I mean, there might be people in their pajamas watching this, for all I know, in their in their back room, and uh, and they could be attending something halfway across the world so uh, yeah. yeah i think we've learned a lot over the last year about how to create that magic online but actually without some of those fundamentals and some of those skills in place that you know john had shared and imparted along with other, others over the years i think we'd have been less well prepared than we were to uh, to try and embrace it really so uh, it's really interesting how it's how it's coming to fruition yeah uh well thanks again uh, tim for for contributing tonight um it for everyone. Great, we're going to move on to our next presenter now, who um, I think knows knew John really well. So I'm going to hand you over to Helen Harrop, who's going to give a talk. Helen, over to you. Um, hello, everybody. And um, I think, as the young kids say, I am rusty AF. So <laughs> let's see how it goes. Um, okay, so I wanted to do a Be More John talk but I didn't really know where to start. This beautiful graphic was produced by Sharon Dale and shared on Twitter. It's from the comments that people left when the, when the um, news of um, John's passing got announced. But I thought actually John wouldn't want us to be more John. He, he would say, do not be more John, be more you. And also listen to Rush while you do that. <laughs> so, so my talk is very much about Rush. So I'm very glad that um, that Tim's talk wasn't. So I that last hashtag was a bit cat, was a bit long. So I decided to go for Rushmore. And um, if if John had liked Wes Anderson films, this would that would have been an even better pun. So I met John at um, Girl Geek dinner, funny enough, in Leeds in two thousand and eight. Um, and I had a conversation with him at the bar that changed my life. Really, I said to him, I wish I could make a living just telling people all my great ideas. And he said, well, that's what I do for a living. And, <laughs> and it kind of blew my mind that the thing I'd kind of been dreaming about doing was something that he actually purported to do and get paid for. So lo and behold, through some very strange, magical twistings of fate, um, a job did come up at the company he was working at, Cero, and I, and I got the job and I started working with um, John and was very honoured to do so. Um, my Twitter name is now has changed three times since then. I think I'm now Hope Grace Fury, but I was when John met me. I was I am Helen Harrop, um, which was um, yeah, a bit more easy perhaps. But unfortunately, then the um, the Tories and their quang, the bonfire of the Quangos happened. And although we uh, our small consultancy company tried to keep everybody um, employed, we couldn't. Uh, but I had the strange um, privilege of making artwork for the people that left. So this was the one I made for John. And it was really from the second I was asked to do it, I knew straight away that I would be doing um, a piece on Rush. <laughs> and so what I thought I'd do is, is, is try and encourage you to, um, to rush more. And you may be thinking, but I don't even like prog rock. And John would tell you, it's just classical music with loud guitars. So don't be afraid of prog rock and you might think but they've been going since 1974 that's nearly 50 years how on earth am I supposed to decide which album to listen to and even John couldn't get his 10 favorite albums down to 10 he 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 chose 18 um but there's easy ways you can get into being a, a rush addict and one of them is by simply noticing that once a day it is rush o'clock at 21 12 you, and this is more of a curse than, <laughs> than a gift, really. You will notice that it is rush hour, which is ironic, really, because John's nemesis was the rush hour. He was met, found often sitting in a pub waiting for rush hour to finish so that he could get on a train and get home. But if rush hour seems a bit much every day, then you can just simply look out for the perfect rush weather for rush, for perfect weather for rush fans, which happens as soon as the thermometer hits 21 degrees. And what's interesting about knowing how much 
John loved Rush is that it makes you start reading things into his tweets and what he says. As soon as he mentioned the word Rush, I would start thinking he was making a Rush reference. And for this one, I was sure that Sugar Rush was Sugar was a Rush track. And in fact, went off to listen to it. But no, these are just donuts. This was just a Sugar Rush to keep everybody happy at um, the Comms Hero event. So one of John's other great loves was radio. And he, I'm not quite sure if he loved or hated Desert, 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 Desert Island, Desert Island Discs, but I know that he was very upset that a Rush track had never get, been chosen. So if any of you end up on Desert Island Discs, Discs please choose one on John's behalf. Um, John and I both um, admired Ken Robinson. And this quote re really, for me, summed up as much about John as it does about Ken Robinson. So I thought I'd share it. So really, if you remember only one thing about this talk, and John would say, avoid rush hour, but embrace rush. And in John's honour, I've invented a new cocktail. It's called the Rushmore. And it's, um, I'm holding one here. It's exactly like a white Russian, except you have to listen to rush while you're drinking it. So please, if you've got a glass, raise it to John. To John. Thank you, Helen. Yes. Oh. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. And to, to um, carry on the punning, that um, I've now got an adrenaline rush to go along with my... <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I, I have to confess, I, I don't know a single rush track. <laughs> Has anybody else? Is anybody else like that? Is it not... Not familiar with the single rush track. No, I'm a, I'm a huge fan, unfortunately, either. Right. Okay. Uh, well, just me then. Is oh, there, hello, Chris. Is there, is, Helen, is there a rush track which we all know but don't realise we don't know if we don't know it's rush? Oh my God. Um, spirit of Radio. <laughs> spirit of yeah, radio. I, just, I think the Spirit of Radio is probably most well known. And um, so I, so first of all, I'd say if you're going to listen to a track, listen to, um, the, the main track off of 2112 because that's 20 minutes long so that's a good start I'll give you a good start Rush. and also it's about robotic priests becoming our overlords which I feel is very timely yeah and 90 obviously 1984 has already happened but we've still got 2112 to look forward to so you could do that and I also wanted to ask Mike if Mike Chitty if he knew that John was one of his first fifth his first five followers on Twitter, I didn't know that. I wow! Didn't know that. I spotted Crikey. it. Yeah, I spotted it when I was going when I was raking my way through John's tweets to look for Rush stuff. And Blimey. yeah, it came. You know, when you could you could go to a website, couldn't you, and say who are my first five followers? And Mike was one of, and um, John was one of yours. So, and then the last thing I wanted to just say was about one of the things that struck me when I was looking at the, um, just the sort of banter bit that I had with, with um, John over the years, which was mostly, to be fair, us missing each other at stations, me going through Leeds and him following through 20 minutes after me being in Sheffield the day before he's going to be there and things like that. But there were so many ideas he had, and, and two of them I loved. One was a the idea for a classic there was a classical hack day and he had an idea for a classic rock hack day i don't know if that ever happened yeah. <laughs> and then another one was um classic rock album covers on cakes which i still feel like would, that would be a brilliant um business idea if i'm in anybody fancies baking but yeah so that was i think if if you go back and look through john's tweets um some of his best ideas are still left there to take so there is an, an, an idea which I always have to share just with uh, Australian man, but is in mind to that. In Brisbane, there is a cake shop called the Obscene Cake Shop, where every cake is named in some way with a swear word or rude words of obs obscenity. Um, uh, so, you know, kind of you have the, the, the best fucking cheesecake, the, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, giant chocolate piece of shit, which is a big sort of like a blonde brownie. And, and, and he went on and he gets quite creative and quite obscene. I had to buy my son a cake there and he spent about an hour sitting there staring at them going, I'm going to keep looking at these, Dad, and I'm going to read out every single name. 
<laughs> Thanks for that, Chris. I was going to mention that uh, swearing is a part of the better culture, uh, culture, uh, but I didn't know if children were uh, online and viewing. So uh, we well, hadn't had any swear, swear words up until then. But ever since recently, the, uh, the latest Boris Johnson song that's threatened to become a Christmas number one has been blasted rather loud in our house and we've given up trying to protect the child. <laughs> I, think I'm, I think I've heard about this particular song, but uh, we'll move on to our next presenter before uh, before it's mentioned. So, Noel Curry, take it away. Yay. Hello, all. Um, so, uh, just a little bit of preamble. Um, I got to know John a little bit uh, through doing agriculture for all these years. Um, but I didn't really feel like I knew him well enough to do a talk about John. So this is going to be the first talk that's uh, not about John, I'm afraid. It's just one of my uh, silly chats that I like to do. Uh, but John always seemed to enjoy those ones. So I'm hoping that uh, he would have enjoyed this one. Also, I was looking back over uh, at Better Culture and realised I did my first talk 10 years ago at Better Culture. And this is my 10th Better Culture talk. So... Um, it's another silly one for the archives. So let me share my screen and we'll get started. This is a good time of year to have a clear out. So I've trawled through my old Better Culture file and I'm now officially chucking out all my half formed and half baked ideas. This is the list of all the talks I'll never get around to doing. First up, as a TV editor, I do a process called grading where you adjust the colors of each shot so that they all match each other. I have various tools to help with this process, like you can see here, the RGB parade, histogram, and the vector scope. The vector scope measures the hue of the colors on the screen. And when I was learning about this, I asked a more experienced editor what this line was for. And he said, that's for the line for checking skin tone. I immediately took umbrage with this because I assumed that it was calibrated to measure Caucasian skin tone a digital version of the old skin colored crayons that used to knock around in my youth. But the editor soon corrected me. Apparently all human skin is the same hue and that hue is pink. Now, admittedly, some people's saturation and luminosity levels vary wildly, giving us a vast range of skin tones, but underneath it all, we're pink due to the red blood that pumps through our veins. Minds were going to be blown with this talk, trust me. Another idea was to talk about pie. Pi is defined as the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter, but is also an irrational number and its decimal representation never ends and never repeats. What this means is that every conceivable number exists in the digits of pi. And because anything, a date, a sentence, a picture, can now, thanks to computers, be represented as a number, therefore everything exists in pi. The date you die is in pi. The face of your current or future life partner is in pi. The last thing eaten by the person who accidentally kills you in 30 years is also in pi. Even mundane things like your phone number is in pi. Indeed, I even texted the first fo mobile phone number I could find in pi for this idea, but as yet, no reply. But trust me, if I'd gotten around to this talk once again, minds would have been blown. Now, another idea that I had was to do a five minute talk about awkward pauses. <clears throat> just, just waiting for the thing. <laughs> I was just going to see how uncomfortable I could make an audience by repeatedly not having enough words to fill the time for each slide. I think less minds would have been blown by that one. Whereas conspiracy theories, now, most of these are obviously untrue, but I suspect that lurking amongst the piles of internet generated tin hat theories, there are a couple of true ones hiding in plain sight. Not only that, I think that the, all these other conspiracy theories have been generated on purpose to obscure the truth about the couple that are actually real. That's right. I think conspiracy theories are a conspiracy theory. Trust me. Minds would definitely have been blown by this one. And the last talk to get a mention before it hits the bin is another issue that's close to my heart in my work as an editor. Continuity errors, or more specifically, 
those programs that take such glee in pointing out minor continuity errors in TV and film. Look at these idiots and how they failed to match up two shots that were filmed possibly months apart, ignoring the fact that cuts made for perfectly valid artistic reasons may result in an unavoidable continuity error. These are the people who would read a Dickens novel and complain about the kerning, or look at a Picasso and point out a chip in the frame. I even saw one ridiculing a minor error in Pearl Harbor, an error that can only have been spotted after repeated viewing. So if someone watched the atrocious Pearl Harbor more than once, then the only idiot making ridiculous errors was them. No minds would have been blown about that one admittedly, but I would have had a good old vent. In conclusion then, I encourage you all to have a proper old clear out of all your old ideas. Here are all the other Better Culture titles I didn't even have time to explain, but which I am also consigning to the scrap heap. Like old compost, I hope they will encourage the growth of new and better ideas. Because the end is never just the end, it is also a beginning. Thank you very much for listening to my talk and hope you enjoy all the rest of the talks by John this evening. Good night. No curry! Excellent. Awesome. 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 Do you want to add a few more words, Noel, or is that like holding your peace? Just, uh, just to echo what other people have said after meeting John, he was he always struck me as a really kind, gentle soul, and he just uh, was so encouraging of everyone who came to the events. I'll, I'll miss him. Great. Thanks, Noel. That was that was a really clever presentation. I uh, I was really impressed with that, uh, Noel. But then you're a clever bloke, and it reminded me of the time we were in uh, the Corn Exchange in Leeds, and it was a random slide challenge. And for people who don't know the random slide challenge, when people have given their prepared talks, we invite volunteers from the audience to make up a talk on over slides they've never seen before. And there's just 10 slides. So, no, you volunteered to do a talk at, uh, at the Corn Exchange, but you, you kind of, you, you come prepared because you were making notes of each talk. And as it happens, I think there were 10 talks. So what you cleverly did was for each slide, you tried to impose um, a comment from one of the talks that had gone beforehand onto the slide. And you were doing that for all 10 talks onto the 10 slides. Does that make sense? Yes, that's what I did. I think it was, yeah, my finest pair of culture moment. That's not too big headed of me to say. Of, of I, which there I, are many, no. Let's not, <laughs> let's, don't be immodest. There, but that one particularly just blew me away. I thought that is so clever. So I'd, I'd really like to see some of these other talks brought to life. No, some of them look really interesting on paper. They're in so, the bin. Well, kill your darlings, they say, and then start again. I don't know who said that, but uh, nothing now. So I'm going to pass on to uh, our next presenter, who's um, an experienced and stalwart of better culture. She's done that many of them, and she's a celebrity in herself. So please welcome Peg Alexander. Oh, thank you. Thanks very much. So I'll, uh, I'll I'll sort out the screen sharing in a minute. So a bit like Noel, I didn't know John really, really well. Um, but I did have quite a bit of contact with John through Better Culture and also in terms of being a journalist and, and various other stuff and radio shows and things like that. And certainly I would say um, doing a lot of work with community organisations and around media and everything, you know, the role that John played was really massive in West Yorkshire in terms of helping people kind of get their stories out, understanding social media, making an impact. So although I didn't know John personally really well, I always felt like, we were in the same worlds and that that there was a real connection so uh, when when this came up tonight i thought i do want to do something and i thought i'm going to pull up a, a presentation i'd done before and um, because it just felt really appropriate to do uh, a tribute to john popham so i'm just hoping i can sort this screen sharing business out here so i think it would be really easily easy actually today to do something quite sad or to do something about 2020 which has obviously been i think the technical term for 2020 in the uk is shit but instead i'm going to talk about something that can change the world and that is 
being nice because I think that being nice is a very, very underrated attribute. Somehow we've kind of made the word nice into something a bit insipid, a bit pathetic, damned with faint praise, but we shouldn't because being nice is really, really important. Now, there are loads of studies that have been done into how and why being nice and giving to others makes us happy. And of course, MRI scanning has made it possible uh, for scientists to actually understand what's going on. And what they've discovered is that, in short, giving and being kind and nice actually lights up the same parts of our brain that get activated when we are happy. There was a big study done in uh, Switzerland a couple of years ago, massive study to try and work out why. What they did, was they gave all the participants $100 and half of them were told to spend it on themselves and the other half was told to spend it on other people. And uh, they MRI scanned them all the way through the experiment. And what they discovered was that the happiness parts of the brain were activated simply when people started thinking about spending the money on other people. So they didn't actually have to spend it, they just needed to think about it. And they also discovered that that group made more generous decisions in other areas as well. So what they discovered was that one bit of generosity led to even more generosity. And the good news for those of us who don't have much cash is they discovered you didn't have to spend a lot, even small amounts of money actually led to those happiness parts of the brain being lit up. I think things like random acts of kindness and pay it forward um, have been wonderful. And I love the way social media has helped with that and people like John have, have, have made those messages out there because of course a lot of the time social media actually can make us pretty unhappy. So I love the fact it can do good things and of course during the pandemic it's never been more obvious about the ways that people have come together to offer help to other people, people they know, people they don't know, reminding us how niceness and small acts can we had individuals who looked after neighbours that maybe they'd never even spoken to before the pandemic started. There were organisations in just a matter of days that managed to transform and deliver essential services. None, I think, were better example than here in Leeds, Voluntary Action Leeds and the Council, within days of lockdown started, managed to get services running across the whole city. 8,000 volunteers signed up to help. This was good people doing good things and making good news. Now, talking of news, one of the things I don't like about the human psyche is our love seemingly for bad news and for bad stories. And of course, the media and part of that has been really guilty of wanting to push bad news and bad stories. Uh, I think it's got better through the pandemic. We've got better about that, but there's still a lot of cynicism. This is a quote from Richard Curtis, the filmmaker, talking about why we're so obsessed uh, with bad news. And I think we do need to challenge if we've got that cynicism inside us, because actually uh, we want to say that the world is run on kindness and love. Actually, it is run on that. And we want to have more of that. Certainly something I'm looking to do next year is putting much more kindness into news and politics work that I do. The pandemic has shown us what matters. I mean, this just sums it up. I think it really does sum it up, doesn't it? Because essentially, I believe people are good, that we are built to be kind, we are built to be nice, and we are built to love. So if any of you are feeling cynical about this, going, oh, it's all very well, you know, even if you just want to think about it from a selfish perspective, being kind and being nice will make you personally happier. Every bit of research into what makes people happy has discovered that once your basic needs are covered, right, there are two things that make people happy. One is appreciating what you have in your life, even if it's not exactly what you want to have, and thinking more about what you have than what you don't have. And the other one is giving to people and uh, giving to other people. Ah, there's one other bit of research that's found, get a dog, right? Dogs make you happy. Loads of bits of research have discovered that. Because niceness and kindness is important. So selfishly, if you just want it to be about yourself, do that, but it's also important for society. One other bit of research I want to mention was some research looking into what, what does it mean to be nice? And they broke it down to mean compassion and politeness. And they discovered that compassionate people behave like good Samaritans and polite people act like good citizens. Well, do you know what? I think most of us would love to be able to do one of those. If not, would like to think that we can do both of those things. So let's take our lead from Julie Andrews, right? Let's start at the very beginning because it's a very good place to start. And let's just start with basically being nice, just like John would say. Thank you, Peg. Excellent. And what a... What a message, Peg. 
you can't uh, you can't trump that. Uh, I mean, you can't beat that. We won't <laughs> use that word. Sorry. <laughs> yes, um, but it's, it's funny how the world has to cooperate to work. It has to do. Dis it's almost despite what the political leaders try and do, the world carries on because people cooperate and they only cooperate through kindness. That And we have to appreciate that to realize why society can continue. And to take you up on, on what you said, um, Peg, about how you know it's, it's built on love, we don't really appreciate how how we're motivated until something happens spontaneously. Something, if there's an accident in the street, I can guarantee most people would try and help. They wouldn't even think about it. They would immediately, can I help? What, what do I, and try and assist the So it's not just about, you know, giving money or whatever. It's about just helping that little act of kindness. Absolutely spot on, uh, Peg. Do, do you want to say a few more words? No, not really. Just I could see a couple of pop messages popping up saying be kind. So I, I just think I've got here. There we go. Be nice or be history. So there we go. Let's just be nice. Excellent. That's all, all we've got at the moment. Let's do it. Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, if um, it's got to the stage where th there is no good news anymore. So you have to create your own good news by being kind to people and passing the the kindness on passing the the love on just before i forget uh because i i did forget about the random side challenge it uh, it never occurred to me that we might want to do it at this event if somebody wanted to volunteer unfortunately i don't have any slides so um if anybody did want to have a go at the random slide challenge one of our presenters would probably have to try and source five images or something that they could just randomly put up and a volunteer could um, try and make up a story over those slides. Just an idea. So uh, as we uh, finish with our um, penultimate presenter, perhaps somebody could be thinking about whether they'd want to do a random slide challenge. And if they did, maybe Mike uh, could source a few images. We'll find out. We'll find out after our next presenter whether this is going to become a reality. Um, we can even stop recording if somebody needs the reassurance that the world isn't going to see them, whatever they do. So I'm going to pass you over to uh, Mike Wallace, who's, um, who's going to talk about something really interesting. Mike, over to you. Thank you, Ivor. Um, so this is a conversation that uh, John and I have had many times over the years that we've known each other. Um, John was very interested in telling stories and he wasn't, he didn't really care about the medium in which they were told. Um, he, what he really cared about was people getting their tales out there. Um, but because of the way the world worked, his focus was all about technology. And that was his job basically was to tell stories through technology um, and utilizing technology and how to do that and a conversation that John and I had in fits and starts over years was about um, why we still need to have an analog world uh, and the importance of that so that's what this talk is it's uh, it's one that I've um, had kicking around for quite a while so uh, let's just see where we go with this. So my talk is why analog? Um, this is a, a, like I say, it's a conversation. Why would we still want to have analog photography in a world where digital cameras exist? Um, why do we want to run things off film? Why do we want to um play uh, board games why do we want to, when computer games exist and this is to me an argument that is all about the gray space um so whenever john would say this to me he, he would be doing it deliberately to wind me up um and i knew that and so my argument would always be to go to analog photography um i have far more film cameras 
than uh, digital cameras. Uh, and I actually make more film cameras out of things like uh, matchboxes and syrup tins. Um, a couple of years ago, I made a boat into a camera and you'll see an example of that a little bit later on. Um, I do things like make a um, film developer out of coffee and orange juice um, and make my own light sensitive paper. And I'm able to make photographs using basic household chemicals and things like that. And the reason I do this is because it's art. It's turning um, a medium that has been commoditized so simply by everybody having a mobile phone in their pocket that can take instantaneous photographs of whatever they're looking at and upload it all over the cloud. And it's instant gratification. So to me, instant gratification is so much more boring uh, than like actually waiting for the results. The act of making something yourself is so much more satisfying than just pushing a button and letting it all happen for you. Because when you do that, when you let, when you try and do things in the analog space, the end result is never quite what you expect. Um, it's so final. You have to take what you're given. And so you have to prepare well or accept the variations that may occur. And the variations are the beauty. They're what make a sterile photograph live. They can turn documents into art. And yeah, OK, it takes longer to get a photograph from doing this kind of thing. There are apparently much more efficient processes. But and what you get at the end may not be what you want. But what you're doing is front loading the effort. You're taking 10 minutes thinking and concentrating about what you feel the end result should be at the start of the process, instead of spending two hours tinkering in Photoshop at the end, endlessly cropping color balance, balancing, tweaking, adding tones and overlays. And to end up with something that, depending on what the fashion says, is like 1930s cameras anyway, using 1970s film. And if you reduced everything that you did to the most efficient process, which is what digitalization tends to do, then we wouldn't bake. We wouldn't eat soup. We'd eat nutrient paste that was supposed to give us everything that we needed to survive a day of toil. We wouldn't have a civil service or a diplomatic court. We wouldn't have flower beds. We wouldn't have a fashion industry. We wouldn't have an interesting food world where we can explore other people's cultures and learn about uh, other people's lives through the things that they're interested in. We wouldn't have clothes other than smocks and sandals made from planks and twisted fibers. We wouldn't have exploration or scientific discovery or the drive to find more interesting ways, which is more efficient ways in some respects of doing things. And it's in celebrating the inefficient, the variable, the unpredictable, and the process that requires more effort that we provide juxtaposition and contrast to the world around us in the spirit of finding new ways of doing things. Um, and as an example of that, what you've got on the screen now is a solargram. This is an, a camera, a, a, an image that took eight years to be processed and it showed the sky uh, every single day, the sun tracking across the sky. And so I had a go at doing this myself this year. And that is six months worth of solar tracking across the sky. And you think, well, why would you do that? And because if you need to, you can find out what the weather was doing that day and you can build up an image of how the future is going to look. So if you want to, to uh, plant crops, then finding it in the right space would be a, on that graph would be a really useful thing. Um, but in the end, it's just a lot. It, a lot of it is just art. And when you turn boats into cameras you have to live with the results and that is what you get and that's me thank you all very much Woo. thank you mike brilliant as ever uh, so thought provoking which is what you're good at good at finding these asking these questions and as it happens mike um I'm, I'm currently writing a short story and it's part philosophical and I sort of imagine a world where um, technology advanced so far that basically you can sit in your bed all day with wires in your head and you can you can program certain pulses to arrive into your brain 
that would either evoke pleasure or, or sadness or whatever emotion, you sort of went through the gamut. Uh, and I think, is, is that preferable to actually having to go out and live a life? And I think it's, it's close to what you've touched upon there because, you know, you, we can have things instantaneously now, but is that how we want to live? Is that really the way, because I've got um, an electric bike as well. And quite often I get passed by, you know, lycra clad cyclists who just say, cheating, cheating. And, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm enjoying the cycling, but it makes, it always makes me think, am I cheating? And if I am, what is it that I'm cheating? Am I cheating myself because I'm not experiencing the efforts of cycling? Or if it's not that, what else could it be? Um, and I haven't, I haven't been able to come up with an answer. So I don't know whether you have, Mike, but it's, so it's, it's, I do have an answer to that. And the answer is that whenever you look at doing something, anything, it doesn't matter what it is. It's getting out of bed, it's getting in the shower, it's going to the pub or whatever. Look at your motives for doing it in the first place. And if those motives to you seem questionable, um, or if you're doing it for a reason that you wouldn't, be 100% honest explaining to anybody else, then that's cheating yourself in any way. The now, I, I, it probably begs the question that a lot of people probably who set off to work are thinking, it's not really, it's not really what, I, you know, my reason for doing this aren't really honest ones. So, no, that's true. what you're saying. I, so, so I, I have a previous talk about this, about Skinner Boxes, which is available on Vimeo if you search for Mike Wallace. I remember it, Mike. Box. I remember it. Um, and uh, and, and uh, that exact topic does come up in it. Um, it's basically about the fiction that is money. And uh, we, you know, we do have to live in the world. We don't like the rules, but, you know, we... I, I recommend people Google it. Skinner Box. Mike Wallace. Better culture. And uh, they'll find... The video uh, absolutely fascinating mike thanks ever so much for that do you want to say a few words about john or is that you happy with i said my words at the start so brilliant um yeah but thanks everybody and thank you mike has anybody thought they might like to try a random slide challenge um ivory just letting you know uh i have an old random slide challenge on my computer ready to go if anyone wants to do one it's got excellent the second part of the question has been answered. So already now is a volunteer. Would anybody care to uh, to volunteer? Sure. We've got. I, I, will, I would need to warn, warn, warn my wife, uh, warn Joe, uh, just because she's on the phone to Etihad Airlines trying to find a flight. So don't disturb me for two and a half minutes. But I'm happy. <laughs> so, so Chris, you you're volunteering, are you? Great. Uh, that's assuming that you haven't seen the slides that Noel has up his sleeve, but we'll take that chance. OK, let's do this. Uh, Chris is going to do a random slide challenge. For those of you who haven't seen it, how it's done before, this will be a treat for you. It was always the highlight of the Better Culture evening because everybody knew this is real jeopardy. The person and then I will. You're good to go, Chris. Away you go. OK. And lo, it's a flight to Australia. Finally, there's a way forward. We can get there. We can get right around the world. Absolutely no transit. We just go up into space and wait for the world to turn around among us and we land. And we'll arrive slap bang into the quarantine zone where we'll be deposited by aliens in a specially encapsulated little pod down um, somewhere between mm -hmm. Sydney and Melbourne. And these are the guards and envoys that take you to your quarantine accommodation in Melbourne. They're fully hazmatted up. Um, you're sort of governed and secured from everywhere. And the only breathing thing near you is a horse because they've decided that horses don't get mm -hmm. coronavirus. Um, unfortunately, cats do get coronavirus. <laughs> uh, and this particular um, beast uh, shows the biggest way risk that you have are contracting coronavirus, which is if a cat comes up to you and turns around and rubs its nether regions <laughs> in your face, uh, you will then need additional testing. And in Australia, that means an additional week's quarantine in a special device like this. Um, and what that is is here is this is what you've, it looks like a car crashed into a window. In fact, in between that rubble and everything is encased a quarantinee who at some point sneezed uh, in the last month. Um, and that is what happens uh, in Australia if you try and escape hotel quarantine and go down the Yarra River down to the local vineyards to try and treat yourself in, in the middle if you go stir crazy. Um, they've bred some uh, interesting adaptations of the normal Australian fauna. 
Um, this is also an adaptation of the Australian fauna. It's not a wall. It looks like a wall, but you can see that that's an eye. Uh, it's about to sort of come to life, and it's just sat there dormant, like a saltwater crocodile tends to sort of chill out up in the uh, in the Northern Territories um, until it sort of bites you. And when it bites you, it goes all fat, and it looks like this um, once it's well fed. So if you see one of these, you're okay for around about half an hour while it digests through its 22 stomachs and eventually sort of plops something out the other end, then you go about 30 seconds and you need to dash like this. And this is a particularly good way of avoiding these creatures because if you can get the water to spray up like a sort of bearded dragon, um, the, uh, the opposing kind of crocodile vintage evil beast will get very, very, very frightened indeed. Um, and it will cover its eyes with its tongue so it doesn't have to face the horror of what it is that it's looking at uh, in front of you. Um, and it will then catch a diseased infectious from its, its tongue as well, because that is also a known coronavirus uh, transmission method, especially with our new variant. Um, uh, in fact, in the United States, they have got a new variant of coronavirus for every star on their flag and an additional one for the star on this woman. And this woman has been added because there simply aren't enough stars to go around uh, with the imperial... Uh, empire expansion and so forth. And this is pitch black, and that assumes the end of it. Thank you. <laughs> Yay! Chris Ingold, everyone. Oh, that brought back some happy memories. That was uh, classic. Well done, Chris. You, you slaughtered it there. Absolutely brilliant. Loved it. And thank you, Noel, for producing these great images. Uh, fantastic, actually. It worked really well with the, uh, the storyline. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is how the random slide challenge is, is done. Uh, in the past, people generally had a few beers and that kind of thing, and sometimes it got quite interesting. Sometimes it crashed and burned. I have to be honest with you, it did some, but generally, it you know, someone would come out with a line that just took the roof off the, uh, the venue and people just applauded it, you know, it was brilliant. It was brilliant. And it can be again. It can online. It can be again. It can. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Chris. Thanks, Noel. Uh, let's, go on to, let's move on to Karen Gilbert, who's going to, in verse, tell us how this evening has been. Karen. Thank you, Ava. And I was just thinking before about the, um, I think I've only met John once, but it was very memorable because um, I was at a thing called a Hope and Social Garden Party. And he had this t-shirt that had the Twitter logo across it and then his, his um, user ID. And, I, and that was, it was quite a few years ago. I don't know, my sister Helen might be able to help me how long ago that was, but probably, I don't know, just seven, eight years ago, something like that. And, um, and it was just like this moment of pure genius of that's as easy as it is to market yourself. <laughs> it's just have the bravery to literally put who you are on your t-shirt and walk around with it. And because it just created the invitation, he didn't have to go around begging people to follow him. It just said, follow me. And that was it. So that was um, very memorable. And, and I'm afraid I didn't get any poetry out of Chris's slides because I was laughing too much. So I apologize <laughs> for that. Um, right, I have a screen to share here, which is a beautiful bit of art that um, Helen Harrop found on Twitter for me and um, thought it would make a nice, um, piece to put up so that I don't have to think about how I compose my face while I read this poem. So here we go. I will be with you, joining you in muted ways amidst the ones seeking lives of connection. Let your audience assemble into your story in the words and musics that follow your years and imaginings. Have the courage to remember the slow way the kind of midnight tribute to the questions you've been carrying beneath all of your whimsy and confusion. Be silent, only long enough to fall into a love of your trains of thought and uncompromising magic. Be your own contribution, your own understanding, your own rush towards whatever you're afraid of. Your spirit is coming home, spinning through your ideas and luminescence. Make your art, make things happen, and explore the world through your discoveries. Live and be brilliant until you realise you are the world, held in an endless instant of wonder.
Beautiful. Uh, thanks, Karen. That was spot on.